Welcome back to another episode of the Messy Reformation. My name is Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize whenever Reformation happens, things get messy. And we're seeing things get messy in the Christian Reformed Church, and things are going to keep on getting messy in the Christian Reformed Church as Reformation starts to happen. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. We want to keep saying thanks to all of you who are faithfully listening each week and faithfully sharing our content. Keep it up. Think of people who would benefit from hearing this podcast and share it with them. We're hoping these conversations will keep spreading throughout the Christian Reformed Church. They are spreading through the Christian Reformed Church, and we're seeing Reformation begin. So keep up the good work. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Monday. We're also dropping episodes on YouTube every Monday, so you can go over to YouTube and listen to our podcast there, and that also gives us the opportunity to have a conversation in the comments section. So check us out on YouTube and click subscribe there as well. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part two of Willie and I's reflections on the last nine months of this podcast and some of the current issues in the CRC. And one of the things I've been thinking of over the past couple of weeks, as I've kind of lamented the materials coming out of the denomination is, um, how beautiful would it be if we bring, if we can fight for reformation in our denomination, and we finally get to be a denomination where I'm looking forward to the materials coming out. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine looking forward to the banner coming out each week? Um, Because you know it's going to be uplifting for your soul. It's going to be addressing topics that are going to build up the church and and actually looking forward to what's coming out. It makes me want to actually stay and fight for Reformation Mm -hmm. because I see how beautiful it could be if we could um, bring Reformation to the banner and and some of these other offices in the CRC and and actually have a denomination that's once again um, equipping the saints for works works of ministry. Yeah, I completely agree with that. A lot of people would tend toward the notion of, well, I guess it's time to go. Whereas I think our perspective is more, well, no, there's still work to be done here. (laughs) Uh, And I I truly do think that the spirit of God is still at work uh, in the main, in the Christian Reformed Church. And while he is still at work, I really think we ought to be joining with him in how he is carrying out his sovereign purposes and being the instruments by which he accomplishes his, his goals. So I, I do completely agree with you. That's obviously, like you stated, that's why we started this podcast. And that's why so many people have come on the podcast. And that's why so many people who have listened have decided to stay and to uh, uh, keep fighting the good fight as we exhort people at the end of every episode. So yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. Yeah, and I I was reminded of that again. Um, Today, I was listening to a podcast, another podcast I highly recommend. It's called uh, the Stories Are Soul Food uh, podcast. And it's uh, with N.D. Wilson, who is probably my favorite fiction author out there. And he was talking about the importance of, of understanding and seeing your life as a story and understanding your your role in that story but also he was talking about what do you do when things get hard and uh he said um okay think about your favorite story um and so i'll throw out a, a goodie you know um lord of the rings mm-hmm. um say you're frodo or even better maybe sam mm. <laughs> um and things are getting hard and uh, you, it, it really stinks. You don't think you can go on. Uh, you can't take another step. Um, what do you do in that point of the story? If you are in, you know, if this is your story, do you quit? You say, I've had enough. I'm going back to the Shire. I'm going to hide in the Shire. Things are better there. Or do you, like Sam, <laughs> You know, Frodo keeps going on, and then Frodo can't go on any longer. So Sam comes up, 
picks him up on his shoulders and says, if I can't carry the ring, I'll carry you. And he starts carrying him up Mount Doom. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that stirs our hearts. That that scene in that movie stirs our hearts because God created us to be that type of people. Um, who, when we see a fight in front of us, we see a battle in front of us, we don't turn and run away from it like a bunch of chickens, um, but we turn and we go into the fight and we say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know if I can do this, but here we go. Help me. And we run into the fight and we see what God will do. And sometimes that may mean, you know, we might lose the battle. Um, Mm -hmm. If that's in God's plan, we could lose this battle over the Christian Reformed Church. But um, but in this story, we want to be the people that didn't run away from the fight, um, but the people who stayed in the fight and and fought for reformation. I completely agree with that. Uh, I love that scene in Return of the King uh, that that is made to resonate with the viewers. You're absolutely right. I also think of more modern instances like uh, the Minneapolis miracle uh, <laughs> uh, just cause I'm a Vikings fan. So uh, when that pass was thrown to Stefan Diggs and he wasn't tackled, he stayed up and he stayed in bounds and ran in. Uh, I thought to myself, that is completely unbelievable. And now if I rewatch that game, the most fun part to watch is when you think the Vikings are going to lose. Because Mm -hmm. that that means that, you know, having already been been given knowledge of the end when you're watching the middle, it makes the middle so much more worth it. And it makes watching the end even that much sweeter. And when I read texts for my devotions, I've been going through Matthew and uh, I'm in Matthew 16 right now. um, Peter's confession, uh, Caesarea Philippi, when he says, uh, uh, you you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and Jesus says to him, "Well, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it." Uh, I take that as a promise, uh, not just for the first century church, but for the church of all ages. I take that as a promise for the church right now. Um, I see the Great Commission as are the church's marching orders, not just for the first century, but for right now. And I think for the church to become lazy and stagnant and just look at those passages and say, well, I'm just going to leave my hands off it. God's going to do what he's going to do. No, he uses means to accomplish his purposes. And if we can be the means by which he accomplishes the reformation, even of portions of the CRC or of certain revitalizations in our culture, then we ought to be active and engaging in these things. There are obviously imperatives in the biblical text that say you ought to be doing these things if you want to see fruit from your labor. So I think that is a call for us to be active and diligent uh, to what God has called us to do. Amen. And one of my favorite um, things that has been pointed out to me recently about that promise, um, that the gates of hell will not stand against the church. Um I always grew up thinking of that as the gates were coming after the church and weren't going to prevail over the church. Right. And someone uh, pointed out gates don't fight. Um, And so the imagery is not of the gates coming after the church, but the church coming after the gates. Mm -hmm. Um, And another Lord of the Rings um, (laughs) analogy is it's like the church standing at the gates of Mordor, right? It's like that little band of, of uh, of warriors standing at the gates of Mordor and the whole and the, the army of Mordor coming out against them and the church standing there saying these gates, even though the even though it looks bleak, even though it looks like there's no way we could ever win this war, those gates we will kick down the gates. They mm-hmm. won't prevail against us. We will knock down the gates, gates of hell. And, uh, and, and again, that stirs us as, as the church. We're not, we're not being attacked all the time. We are actually on the offensive. We're marching out as the church, um, um, fighting for reformation. And there's times where it looks overwhelming, and times when it looks impossible that reformation could ever happen. And, and we know there's seasons, too, where, where the church gets, um, the church is shrunk down and, and small. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, um, we still continue to fight the fight that God has put in front of us. 
Absolutely. Uh, I think the whole uh, vision that we should be fighting with is the vision that we win and Christ will accomplish what he says he's going to. I heard uh, Bob Godfrey give an address at Ligonier a few years back, and it was entitled, I Will Build My Church. So if you want to look at that, I highly recommend that. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I, I actually read this at Synod 2019, uh, towards the end of it. Uh, Bob says, the devil may build the strongest fortifications imaginable to resist the advance of the church of Jesus Christ, but those gates will be overcome by the Savior in building his church so that not one of the elect will be lost. And when I see that, when I see the promise of Christ building his church, the elect being ingathered to him, people coming to faith in Christ and seeing the truth, and the earth becoming full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, then I really do think that we fight with a purpose. Uh, we, we have a promise, but if we have a purpose, I think we fight all the more diligently on these fields. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and, and we fully acknowledge that um, Christ will build his church, and that does not necessarily mean the Christian Reformed Church will Amen. always be around. Um, and it's a good reminder for us. We're fighting for something bigger than a denomination. We mm -hmm. are fighting for a denomination. We want to see Reformation in this denomination, because I think it would bring glory and honor to God um, for people to watch a denomination turn and repent of its foolishness and commit themselves to just orthodox, godly, holy living in the proclamation of the gospel. I think that would bring glory to God. Um, but God can receive glory through um, the downfall of a denomination that's turned their back on him as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to fight for Reformation, but if it dies, um, we don't need to be downtrodden as well because Christ will still build his church and he'll build it with or without the Christian Reformed Church, which mm -hmm. would bring us um, tons of humility. Amen. Well said. Yeah, on this note, I, I had told you, I don't know where, I didn't know where to put this in, but I, just, I want to read a quote um, that jumped out at me today too. It's uh, again from N.D. Wilson. It's from a book he wrote called Empire of Bones. And uh, it's a fiction book, but it's in a spot um it's very allegorical um there it's a an organization that has lost its purpose and mission they were supposed to go out and explore and and kind of have dominion over the earth in their own unique way and they, it's turned into a club where they just hang out together and now it's being destroyed by dragons and uh <laughs> and there's a small band of people who are fighting um to save this uh this institution. And while the whole thing is in, in rubble and, and burning down, um, this little monk says, says this, in every herd, many stampede, while only a few turn to face the lions. Cowards hmm. live for the sake of living, but for heroes, life is a weapon, a thing to be spent, a gift to be given to the weak and the lost and the weary, even to the foolish and cowardly. To love is to be selfless. To be selfless is to be fearless. And to be fearless is to strip your enemies of their greatest weapon. Even if they break our bodies and drain our blood, we are unvanquished. Our goal was never to live. Our goal is to love. And that's the goal of all truly noble men and women. Give all that can be given, give even your life itself. Um, I love that quote. I've got it all over mm -hmm. the place as a good reminder for me. The goal was never to live in the first place. The goal was to give our lives just like Christ did for the, mm. for the salvation of many. And uh, it's just a reminder for us as well um, as pastors fighting for reformation in this. And one of the other things I, I wanted to talk about, because one comment that's come up repeatedly, um, and, it, and it really fits in the middle of this as well, uh, one thing that's come up as I've talked to a lot of pastors is how tired they are right now. Um, tired because of uh, all of the COVID um, craziness wearing on and on and on, the divisiveness in churches, 
the politics of last year, um, pastors weary in the Christian Reformed Church, weary of all of the, the progressive fight, feeling like we're losing the battle, weary of the human sexuality report, weary of all of this stuff. And so I wanted to just to talk a little bit about that, because I'm seeing that not only just in, in the Christian Reformed Church, but pastors are, are tired. We've been fighting um, mm-hmm. for a long time. And uh, I even, I just talked to um, an E-free pastor um, from my town, and uh, their pastor just, he didn't just leave their church, he left the ministry completely. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I was talking to one of their other pastors, and he said they can't even find an interim because their their whole district it has so many vacancies that all the interims are used up, and so there's so many vacancies in the E Free Church because pastors are leaving, and uh, the CRC is seeing that as well too. There's pastors who are leaving churches, leaving the ministry completely because people are just tired and burning out, and uh, it's caused me to think. Uh, just kind of wonder, like, what do you think's behind all of that, Willie? What do you think's behind all of this weariness in pastors um, coming out of this season? Uh, there's a phrase that is jumping out at me right now. Uh, I, it may be from the Revolutionary War or George Washington somewhere, but uh, anytime you want to conquer an enemy in battle, it's uh, you take out the generals. Uh, it's you you attack the leaders. And I really do think that through everything that has been going on just in the midst of our culture and our denominational context. And now with everything happening with COVID-19 and all that that is, I really do see this as uh, a spiritual attack on the church and also primarily on uh, those who are in oversight of the church. Um, the, the elders, the presbytery. Uh, I really do see this as uh, a way of taking them out or weakening them so as to conquer the entire fold. And uh, I, as well, have seen a lot of pastors uh, express their weariness, uh, or as our confessions would say, the burdens of their office. Uh, So I I see that. And that's why when I see pastors uh, going on sabbaticals or taking breaks, going on vacations, they say, it's really much needed. And I say, then you go and you do whatever it is you need to do to come back with a renewed spirit and a right mind to be ready to do ministry again. Because uh, having been in, I would say, the superficial on the superficial level of some of these conversations, I, I know the ins and outs of this somewhat, but not to the level of, of a, an elder or a pastor who is in oversight of a flock. So you can probably speak to those issues better than I can, but have you felt that or expressed those same sentiments? Yeah. I mean, I've definitely felt uh, my own weariness. Um, I I have thanked my um, council and my congregation repeatedly um, that when they hired me, they gave me a a healthy um, vacation and uh, continuing education and pulpit relief kind of package. And so I've, mm-hmm. I have a healthy ability to, to get away and uh, get revived. And that has probably saved me in the midst of all of this, having opportunities to get away, refresh, and then dive back into the fight. Um, I'm definitely the type of... So um, when you go to Calvin Seminary, one of the things you have to do is you have to get a psychological evaluation right away at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, the, the counselor said that... Um, I was a high risk um, for overcommitment and burnout. Uh, <laughs> and, and Willie says, yeah, I've known you long enough. Amen. Amen. Um, yes, that's right. <laughs> and so I have one of those personalities where I'm always kind of biting off more than I can chew. And so you get into a season like this and you see so many things going on, so many things to be done. And uh, it's really easy for me to get in over my head and, and overcommit. And so I need to take a break, get a breather. And then I, I'm i kind of like, uh, I, I sprint and I run really hard. And then I take a break and uh, breathe for a little bit. And then I dive back in and then I sprint and I run really hard. That's just kind of how I, how I work. But that's, that's really saved me. Uh, but one of the things I've, I've thought interesting as I've thought about why 
all of this has been so draining. Um, there's something in the midst of all of this that I think exposes. Um, well, I, it's probably not too strong of a word, word but um, so, some of our own uh, idolatry as pastors, um, where you get into a season like COVID in particular, um, it really reveals our true helplessness. Mm. Um, where I think a lot of pastors look back and they saw their churches um, being attacked and uh, falling apart and uh, people walking away and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, there's nothing you can do. And, uh, and that really, uh, that really wears on us. We don't like as pastors in particular, we don't like to be helpless. We like to do something. We, kind of like to be in control. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden things start happening and your church starts, um, struggling and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and and really wore them out in the midst of this. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I really do think that somebody could have probably written a book. I mean, somebody could definitely write one now in a reflection to everything with uh, COVID and hopefully being on the tail end of it. It's kind of a John Piper-esque title, Don't Waste Your Pandemic. Uh, yeah. And I, I, and I know he wrote his book, Coronavirus in Christ. Um, but I, I really do think, you know, obviously piggybacking on the title of Don't Waste Your Life. Um, I really do think this has been a very challenging season for, for a lot of people. Um, and not just for pastors, but also for parishioners. Uh, a lot of people were told for months and months, uh, you can't attend church regularly, or we may have to find some other option where you can worship either online, or maybe we'll send an elder out to your house every single week and administer the Lord's Supper to you that way and make sure you're being given the means of grace. But this really has been a challenge for a lot of people. But even I see in the midst of this, even practices such as that, the church dispatching her elders to actually shepherd the flock of God that is among them. Uh, I see that as a grace that we have, I don't necessarily want to say taken for granted, but in, in a way, maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, and now we're actually seeing opportunities where we can demonstrate these qualities of a healthy church. Uh, so, and obviously with a lot of churches going live stream, uh, and the gospel being proclaimed in these churches and online week after week after week, um, sometimes multiple times on the Lord's Day. Uh, I think that is uh, just a very encouraging thing to see. But that doesn't mean it doesn't come with a cost. So I really do understand uh, the burden of the offices of the elders and the pastors. And this is just an exhortation to anybody who's maybe not a pastor uh, listening to this is, this is a really good time to continue to support your pastor and to just tell them how much you appreciate them and how well they have weathered this storm, because this has not been an easy time for anybody. And the pastor is in meetings after meetings after meetings. And with all the COVID stuff happening, sometimes those meetings happen on hours notice and saying, we have to meet because these decisions have to be made before this coming Lord's Day. Uh, well, eventually that will take a toll on you and it will be very taxing. So continue to support your pastors and continue to um, encourage your elders and those who are entrusted over your souls to continue to do so with boldness, uh, with love, and with the Spirit of God um, reigning in their hearts. Amen. And uh, that just reminded me too, I, I uh... At another time in my ministry, I went through a long period of um, battle weariness. Um, it had nothing to do with COVID or politics, just issues um, in a church that drug on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And um, I was exhausted and tired, and I had went to my elders and said, "Hey, um, I'm I'm due for a sabbatical." Um, I really need a sabbatical because I am just exhausted. I'm wore out. And uh, the elders approved it and we went to the full council 
and the deacons flipped a lid and mm. said, we're offended that you would even ask for this because we need you right now. We're in the middle of a struggle and you're trying to leave and, and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, but I'm shot. I've got nothing left to give, you know, um, uh, don't do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. not good or not helpful. And, uh, and in the midst of all of this being in a, a, in a different church that has said, here's your vacation, we're going to give it to you. We expect you to take it and we expect you to get your rest. And then you come back and then you fight. Um, it's made a huge difference in my ability to be able to lead people through this. And so, um, I've been a big proponent as uh, unspiritual as it may sound. It's not unspiritual. It's just Sabbath is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, telling pastors, you take your vacation, you take every single day of your vacation. It's not super spiritual to work yourself to death. Um, take it, mm-hmm. take some rest. Um, but also one of the other things that I've found really, really important for me in the midst of this um, weariness is to find just solid brothers um, to be with in the, in the ministry and to help walk through all of this. And so uh, the returning church group has been a great community um, of good conservative guys. You can go there and you can say it, be reminded, like, I'm not alone in this. We've got other guys who are kind of helping lift each other up. There's another group that is kind of coming out of returning church called Abide. You're going to see some of that coming up here where we're going to help try to support the church. But also, um, I mentioned this E-Free Church, that, that E-Free Church in town, um, we've been like a, a band of brothers. Me and the pastors over there, um, throughout all of this COVID, we've just kind of come together and really supported one another um, throughout all of this. And so I just encourage people to, if you're getting weary, if you're getting tired, um, find some brothers to be with you in ministry and help carry you through this. And it doesn't have to be other CRC pastors, right? I mean, obviously right now, if you've got some good faithful CRC brothers, that's a, that's a blessing, grab a hold of them, help them help carry each other up Mount Doom. Um, but, um, but if you don't have any solid faithful CRC brothers around you, there's another faithful pastor in the community by you somewhere, find them and, uh, and go through ministry together. You might find that you feel more in fellowship with that fellow brother who's maybe a Baptist <laughs> or an E free pastor than you have with even some of the fellow CRC ministers. And that's, that's okay right now. We need to, to kind of pull together and uh, help kind of carry each other through these times. It's a, it's a big deal. It is. And when the author of Hebrews says, uh, you know, to keep continue to stir one another up uh, to love and good works, I really see that uh, the opportunity for that right now for the church right now, we are the church militant. We are the church that is fighting. We are on this side of glory. We have to remember that, but it's also good for us to kind of not um, inherit the Elijah syndrome. I and I, I alone am left. Uh, no, no, no. There, there are plenty of brothers as Jason's pointed out, even those who are not in the Christian Reformed denomination or tradition, who are also fighting the good fight, who will come alongside you and walk by you through this. Um, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So we ought to be reminded of those things and continually practice these things day by day. Yeah, and one of one of the passages I've held on to, um, just kind of another another aspect of, of making it through um, the difficult times um, because, you know, there's a, there is an element where you could hear um, what we were saying earlier as just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, do it all in your own strength, charge the hill, win the bat, you know, um, but that's not what we're talking about in, uh, in stepping out into, into difficult situations, stepping out into reformation of the CRC, but even, just stepping out and, and leading your church through a difficult time um, when you don't have, when you don't even feel like you have the strength to keep going. Um, one of the passages that I have held on to in those moments um, is Hebrews 11, mm. um, you know, known as the Hall of Faith. Um, Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16, it says, These all died in the faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, 
having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared for them a city. And uh, as I've meditated on that verse over the years, um, all of these people throughout um, Hebrews 11, all of their, their faith is this act of them putting one foot in front of the other. When they don't know what's coming, when they don't know if they're going to make it, um, but they, they say, Lord, you've called me to take this next step, and I'm going to take that next step in faith, trusting that you'll give me the strength to take that next step, trusting that you'll give me guidance for the next step. And then they take the step, and then they take, and they say, okay, Lord, now I'm going to take the next step, and I'll, I'll pick up my foot, and I will, you'll give me the strength to pick up this foot and put it in front of that foot, and then you'll guide me. And uh, and that's what faith looks like being lived out. I mean, we've all had weeks like that. If you've been in ministry, um, you've had weeks where all of a sudden there's, um, you know, two funerals and, and some other crisis going on, and you have no idea how you're going to get it all done. And you just go, Lord, help. And then by faith, you just start doing the next thing, and you do the next thing, and you do the next thing, and you trust that God will give you the strength, and all of a sudden you're through it. And that's, uh, that's been my, my uh, message to pastors, my message to myself throughout all of this pandemic, and even throughout this uh, reformation of the CRC that we're trying to fight for is um, just do the next thing and do it out of faith, trusting God will give you the strength to do it, trusting that God will give you the guidance to do it, and trusting that God will use maybe this next little pebble that you throw into the pond to bring about some kind of reformation that's going to come. But we don't do any of this on our own strength. And that's a huge reminder. We don't, we, reformation won't come because we're good enough or strong enough or powerful enough. It'll come because we've trusted our God. We've been faithful to him. And then he brought the reformation and changed hearts. Amen. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week where we have a conversation with David Chung. Until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation. Mm-hmm.